Good morning. It's great to have you join us today. Um, we're looking at the sixth and final message in our series, The God Who We Can Trust. And we've been looking at all the different ways that God is faithful to us. And today we conclude our series as we discuss proving God's faithfulness. And we're going to look at how God proves his faithfulness in our giving. Our text today is found in the Old Testament book of Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, Malachi chapter 3. I hope that everything is going well with you. Uh, we've heard a number of prayer needs from various folks, and we've tried to put those uh, in the newsletter that is sent out to you midweek. Uh, if you have prayer needs, or if you have questions for our Ask the Pastor Bible study, that's our normal Wednesday night in-house study format, you can get those questions turned in. Uh, we are uh, need, uh, need some questions, and so get those turned in. We're watching some of the various business reopenings as they take place. Uh, we've been praying about the best time to announce a date for opening our services. We've not made a decision yet. Uh, we're putting together a plan for reopening, and you should have gotten a rough draft of that in this week in your newsletter. Be in prayer that we will make the right choices as to when to reopen so that we can begin meeting together. All right, proving the faithfulness of God. One day there was a fellow who called his church and he said, can I speak to the head hog at the trough? And the secretary, she thought she heard right, but she said, I'm sorry. She said, who do you want to speak with? And the caller repeated, can I speak to the head hog at the trough? And the secretary answered and said, well, if you mean the preacher, then you can refer to him as preacher or pa brother or pastor, but I prefer that you not call him the head hog at the trough. And the man said, well, said, I was planning on giving $300,000 to the building fund. And the secretary quickly spoke up and said, hang on, I think the big pig just walked in. As we begin this morning, let me acknowledge that the church has gotten a bad rap for the perception that it's always asking for money. Uh, caricatures of, of the clergy almost always involve some reference to making people feel guilty about giving. And I just want to say that you can call me whatever animal you want to call me if you're ready to write a check for $300,000. Uh, just kidding. But I want you to know that I wrestle about speaking about giving because I realize that the stakes are high. Uh, perhaps you've tuned in here today and you're already looking for another preacher to go listen to. Please don't feel like we're after your money because that's really not the point of what I want to talk about today. The book of Malachi is a fascinating book. It is the last book in the Old Testament, and the overriding theme of the book of Malachi is God loves you. And God sent his son to deal with our guilt and our shame. Now, we have been looking at the theme, God is faithful, and we've looked at a number of areas in which we have discovered that God is indeed faithful. And I would be remiss if I left out this most impractical application as we wind up our study today. If I have a main point to this whole message, here's, how, here, here's what it would be. How we manage money is directly linked to our discipleship and ultimately our faith. In fact, there are more verses in the Bible regarding our resources than there are about heaven and hell combined. Of the, of the 38 parables that Jesus told, 16 of them 
are about money. The Bible has fewer than 300 verses on prayer, uh, less than 500 verses on faith, and over 2,000 verses that deal with wealth and possessions. And the inescapable conclusion is that how we deal with finances in general and what we give in particular is a big deal to God. Therefore, we do need to focus on our funds, no matter how uncomfortable we may feel about it. Now, to put the text in context this morning, the previous passage in Malachi establishes the fact that Jesus is a refining fire. Now, of course, this is all prophetic in nature. Jesus has not yet come, but the prophecy is in place that Jesus the Messiah is coming. And so it describes him as a refining fire. He cleans us up because we're dirty. And he does his work in us so that he can see his image reflected through us. Now I want you to notice that one of the reasons that the Messiah refines us is so that we can give offerings to the Lord with pure hearts and pure motives. In Malachi chapter 3, Verse number three, listen to what it says. Malachi 3, verse three. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. And verse four says, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. Now, the idea was is that instead of bringing the Lord their injured and their crippled and their diseased animals, once they decide they are going to honor the name of the Lord, they will begin to offer acceptable gifts. They will bring their very best, not their worst, not their leftovers or their hand-me-downs. You know, my guess is is that most of us could stand a little bit of refining in our attitudes towards offerings as well. See, we don't give in order to get. We give because of what we've been given. Now, with that in mind, later on in Malachi chapter 3, we discover five features of grace giving. Five features of grace giving. Let me just share those with you this morning. The first feature is this. We need to refocus on God's character. You know, it's important for us to realize that our view of God determines everything else about us. If we consider God large and and weighty, we're going to live and we're going to give accordingly. If we see God as being out to get us, then we're going to be afraid and we're only going to give to appease his anger. And if we don't think much of God at all, then chances are we're not going to give much as well. Now, verse 6 of Malachi chapter 3 helps us to sort of get refocused. In verse 6 of Malachi 3, it says, For I am the Lord. I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Now, God is speaking here in the first person. That word Lord literally means he who is, and it refers to his immutability or his unchangeableness. And the next phrase repeats and emphasizes the fact. He says, I do not change. To not change means that God can be counted on. He does not waver. He does not falter because he is faithful. Our only hope in life is this. God never changes. He is the one constant that we can count on when everything else around us is moving and shifting. Now, That brings me to a couple of truths that I want to share. And here's the first truth. God does not 
and cannot change in his basic character. You know, nothing that God has ever said about himself will be modified. And nothing that the inspired prophets and the apostles have said about him will be rescinded. All that God is, all that he has always been, and all that he has been and is, he will ever be. Now, we could use the word always to express this truth about God. God is always wise. God is always sovereign. God is always faithful. God is always just. God is always holy. God is always loving. Whatever God is, he always is. So there are no sometimes attributes about God. All of his attributes are always attributes. Now I want you to notice that because God does not change, we can count on him to keep his covenant with us. Specifically, the immutability of the Almighty is the guarantee of his grace. If you want to look at the last part of verse 6 of Malachi chapter 3, it says, Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. You know, God could have legitimately (laughs) wiped out his people because they had broken their part of the covenant. Folks, do you see God as gracious and merciful? You know, I'm convinced that many of us, we do not fully understand the depth of God's love. He does not change, and you can count on him. And because God does not change, we can confidently count on three certainties. The first certainty is his promises never change. You know, over in the book of Romans, chapter 4, verse 21, Paul is writing, he says, and being fully convinced that what he promised, he was also able to perform. If God makes a promise, he's able to keep it. Uh, the, The next certainty that we discover is his purposes never change. Isaiah 14, 24 says, The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand. So the purposes of God will stand. And the third certainty is his personality never changes. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18 uh, describes God, says that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Now all that leads to the second truth that I want to point out to you, and that is because God does not change, God's people can change. Now let me say that again. Because God does not change, God's people, you and I, we can change. Um, (laughs) That leads us to a second feature of grace giving that we need to think about. And that second feature is we need to return wholeheartedly to God. See, The first part of verse 7 is a summary statement of the fickleness of the followers of God down through the centuries. Malachi chapter 3 verse 7, it says, Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. See, they, like you and I today, they have turned away, which means they literally turned him off. You know, when things are going good and our needs are being met, we often turn away from God, don't we? You know, instead of keeping God's word in front of us, we tend to push it off to the side. 
And yet, despite how we live and what we do, God graciously calls out to us with words that reveal his longing for a relationship with us. Look at the next phrase in Malachi 3, 7. He says, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Now that word return means to turn back to what we know to be true. And the door to blessing starts when you and I turn back and we repent and we turn to God. Now you would think these folks would want to turn back to their Redeemer, especially since he promised to restore the relationship with them and even cure their wandering hearts. But once again, God's people, they haven't changed a whole lot over the centuries. Instead of returning wholeheartedly, they deny they even got a problem. If you look at the last part of Malachi 3, 7, it says, but you said, in what way shall we return? See, they're not asking him for some practical ways, you know, how they can step it up spiritually. If you study the book of Malachi, you'll find that this is now the sixth time in the book where they have responded to God like smart Alex, And I think the New Living Translation captures their denial. Uh, in, in Malachi 3, 7, in the New Living Translation, here's how it's worded. It says, how can we return when we've never gone away? See, they don't even think they've done anything wrong. How can they come back when they, in their mind, have never left? How can they repent if they don't think they're guilty of anything? See, the first step back to God, like the prodigal son did when he was out in the pig pen, ask that question, how did I get here? And listen carefully. The first place to start is to admit you've departed. You know, you might not have left on purpose, Maybe it's just been a slow drift. Most of us don't decide to just rebel, but over time we neglect this and we neglect that and we start doing something that maybe isn't such a wise thing to do. And after a while, we recognize we have wandered far away from where God wants us to be. And so we need to ask ourselves, do you want to return wholeheartedly to the Lord. If you do, you need to admit that you need to. Now, second step is, how do I get back? What do I need to do? What changes do I need to make? What path do I need to take? And Malachi's call was to return to the Lord. Now, one way to return to the Lord is to step up our offerings. Look at the third feature of grace giving this morning. Feature number three of grace giving is to realize the importance of giving. In Malachi chapter three, verse eight, it says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Now that word rob, here means to take forcibly. The people didn't like this ac accusation. How could they be stealing from God? And the reason God says that they are robbing him is that they had begun to take what rightfully belonged to him and they kept it for themselves. They lost sight of the fact that God owns everything. Now, as a way to recognize God's rightful rule and his omnipotent ownership of all things, God's people in the Old Testament were instructed to give tithes and offerings. Now, the word tithes literally means a tenth or 10%. And while some would say that this teaching is based on the law of Moses, 
let me remind you that Abraham practiced tithing some 400 years before the law of Moses was ever given. So, you know, way back over in Genesis chapter 14, we read where Abraham gave a tenth of everything that he owned to the priestly king, Melchizedek. Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 11, which is part of the Mosaic law, it challenges God's people to bring their tithes and their special gifts to the place of God's choosing. The people of Israel, they did not give just one tithe. First, they were required to bring a tenth of all produce and livestock or the financial equivalent into the temple for distribution among the Israelites. And the Levites then gave a portion of their tithe to the priests. The second thing Israel was required, they were to bring another tithe during those special feast days. Now, if you read through scripture, um, there were several feasts that took place throughout the year and they were required to bring 10% for each one of those feasts. Third, adults were required to pay half a shekel whenever a census was taken. And failure to tithe properly could have included not giving at all, withholding a part of it, or not giving at the proper time. Whatever the reason, be, you know, whatever their reasons were, they were robbing God. And verse 9 says that the whole nation was under a curse because they were withholding from God. Now, when you and I grovel about giving or we withhold what truly belongs to him, we're robbing God of his right to use us to propel his purposes in the world. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Now the storehouse he's referring to there is a room in the temple, a chamber in the temple, where the tithes and the offerings were kept. Now while we are no longer under the law, Tithing is a good benchmark for believers. In other words, it's a good place to start, sort of like a minimum guide for giving. It's a yardstick by which we can measure ourselves. However, it's easy to tithe and yet miss out on what's really important here. You know, Jesus took the Pharisees to task because they didn't, not because they didn't tithe, but because they had become so legalistic that they no longer cared about their love for God or their love for their neighbor. See, God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the hand. He focuses on the giver and not the gift, because the attitude is more important than the amount. Now, the practice of tithing is a good reminder of who's really in charge of my life. When I give at least 10%, it's a way to be reminded that God owns everything that I have. God wants what my money represents. When we're giving to God, we're just taking our hands off of what belongs to him in the first place. See, my use of my money shows what I think of him because my giving is a thermometer of my love. It's not so much what you have, but rather what has you. That makes all the difference. Now, I don't have time to give a full picture this morning of what the whole Bible teaches about giving, but let me just quickly draw three more principles from just one verse in the New Testament. See, since we're no longer under the Old Testament law, let's see what the New Testament has to say about it. It's essential we understand giving in an age of grace. Now, with all that in mind, in the New Testament, 
what we discover is, is that the New Testament actually heightens rather than lessens the teachings of the Old Testament. So if you just want to look at the Old Testament and say, well, that's an Old Testament thing, you need to stop and read what the New Testament says. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2 says, On the first day of the week, let each one of you, who's that include? Each one of you, <laughs> lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Um, let me give you some principles here. Here's the first principle. Giving should be punctual. You know, the Bible says the believers ought to give on a regular basis. And in this case, Paul said on the first day of the week. The second principle is our giving should be personal. See, giving is something that is inherently individualistic. It's between you and God what you give. At the same time, the Bible makes it absolutely clear that every believer is to give. That's why he said, each one of you. Giving is not just a suggestion. God expects each one of us to be givers. And the third principle is, giving should be proportional. We are to give according to how God blesses us. The believer is to set aside an amount of money in keeping with his income. Proportional giving means that the more God blesses us, the more we're able to give. Now that's what the New Testament teaches, and that may involve giving more than just 10%. See, according to Malachi in the Old Testament, the more you give, the more you are blessed. But in 1 Corinthians, the New Testament, it teaches the more you're blessed, the more you give. You know, someone put it this way, give according to your income, lest God make your income according to your giving. You know, the Old Testament gives a command to tithe by setting a standard of percentage giving. But the New Testament the command becomes the model as we are urged to practice proportional giving. And the emphasis is on liberality, not limitations, not legalism. Now, ultimately, when we give, we are saying that we trust God to take care of our needs. And that leads me to the next feature of giving from the middle section of, of Malachi 3.10. It says, and listen to this. <clears throat> this is God speaking. God says, try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. The fourth feature I want to mention is this. Relinquish control by trusting God. Here's another way of saying that. When we give at least 10% of our income to God, we're saying that we trust him to enable us to live on the other 90%. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, Malachi 3.10 is the only place in the Bible where God tells us, try him, test him. You know, that word test literally means to investigate <coughs> or prove that something is true. God's saying here, you don't believe me? Just try it and see what happens. Now, that doesn't sound right, does it? I mean, we're warned about not putting God to the test, and yet when it comes to giving, God actually invites us to put him to the test. Because the real issue here, it's not about money. It's about our trust. When we decide to give a percentage of our income to the Lord, then we have the opportunity to trust his faithfulness to meet all of our needs. Or we could put it like this. 
when we first give ourselves to the Lord, all other giving is easy. God's saying, I dare you. <laughs> Test me in this and see if I really exist or not. Listen to the New Living Translation here. He says, try it. Let me prove it to you. To me, that's one of the most amazing verses in the whole Bible. He allows himself to be put on trial. He didn't have to make this promise. You know, God could have just simply told us, you give 10% because he demands it, and that's it. You know, I told you to do it, do it. But no, he wanted us to get to know him in, in, in a much deeper way. Is God alive? <laughs> Is God real? Does he love me? Will he keep his promises? And one of the best ways to discover for yourself is to begin to tithe. That brings me to a fifth feature I want to bring out into this uh, of grace giving, and that is we need to rejoice in God's blessings. Rejoice in God's blessings. Look with me at the last part of verse 10. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Verse 11. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. What comes to mind when I say the word tithing? You know, when the subject has come up in some of our Wednesday night uh, and, and Sunday night gatherings, here's what some of our folks have said about it. They've said, do it. It works. It's joyful. Uh, it, it's an act of worship. It's a blessing to be able to tithe. You know, it almost sort of makes me feel sorry for those who don't use tithing as a yardstick for giving. They don't realize what they're missing. God says that he will open wide the windows of heaven and he'll blow us away with his blessings. You know, that phrase, such blessing, it means that God will give us more than enough. You know, the world says the more you take, the more you have. But God says the more you give, the more you are. That word poor in Malachi 3.10 means to make empty. When we trust God with our giving, he will empty his bucket of blessing over top of us and we'll barely be able to stand it. We'll feel like we don't have any more room to hold everything that God has for us. God's saying, I dare you to try and exhaust me with your giving. It's like the old saying goes, you cannot outgive God. You can't do it. Blessings come to those who tithe. And amazingly, Malachi 3.11 says that God will keep certain bad things from happening when we give him our first fruits. See, when I give, I put myself in a position to trust God to meet all my needs. Now, understand, this is about meeting your needs. <laughs> this is not about you know, getting all kinds of health and, and all kinds of wealth and all that. That's not what we're talking about here. If you want to hear that message, you're going to, have to listen to another preacher. But I'm talking about God will supply your needs according to his riches in glory. It's his riches that supplies your needs. In addition, God declares in verse 12 that his plan for global evangelization will be met. Can you just imagine what would happen to the cause of Christ if every believer would give at least 10% to kingdom purposes? Think about that. 
Now, let me just draw all this to conclusion with just a simple application. If you are not already tithing, let me challenge you to take a tithing challenge. I wonder if some of you are ready to take God up on the tithing test. Here's an idea. Why not determine to tithe this summer? For the months of June, July, and August, give like you've never given before. Ask God to prove himself. Now, stop if you'd like in September, but my guess is by that time, you won't want to. I believe God will pour out his blessings in ways you've never experienced before. Uh, I had a fellow in another church who got on me for teaching this in an adult Sunday school class. He said, you know, so there are some elderly ladies in here on fixed incomes. They can't afford to pay tithes. But you see, it all boils down to this. Giving is not really a money issue. Giving is actually a trust issue. The sad thing is what you believe will dictate how you act. Far too many of us say that we believe something, but our actions show what we really believe. We know that God can save our souls. We know God can heal our bodies. We know God can do miracles. But we honestly believe that God is stymied when it comes to our finances. I trust you, Lord. I hang, you know, you hang the planets and the stars in space. You spin all of that movement into motion. You've got the whole world in your hands. But you better let me take care of the money, Lord. I've got a better handle on it than you do. You know, because, Lord, you don't really understand how tight things are. I'm much better at finances than you are. See, it's really not about money. It's about faith. Are you going to take God at his word or not? Are you going to listen to the Lord? Or are you going to put your faith in the balance of your checkbook? See, here's the thing. The blessings of God are not subject to economic shutdowns due to pandemics or inflation or jobs or debt limits or budgets or the stock market or the price of oil per barrel or the economy or any of the other things that we worry about in our day and age. Take God at his word and see what happens. Are you going to trust him or not? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are faithful. Oh, what a message we need for this hour. Lord, we are being bombarded by the word of experts today who keep us all tied up in knots with their words of fear and of anxiety and gloom. But expert or not, they are not you, Lord. <laughs> for you are our refuge and strength. You are a very present help in time of trouble. We forget that you are more powerful than any virus. You are mightier than any cancer. You are greater than any, any army. Lord, we trust you with our lives. We trust you with our families. We trust you with our eternal futures. But for some of us, we have problems trusting you with our giving. Lord, help us to stop giving you our leftovers and begin to give you first before anything else and then trust you with our needs. And Lord, we believe, help our unbelief. Give us courage, give us power, give us strength. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Thanks for joining us today. Don't forget, 
We'll be back Wednesday night at 6.30 as we continue on our live online Bible study on the life of Paul. This week, we're going to be on part three of our study, uh, looking at a man without an identity. And uh, we're looking forward to Wednesday night at 6.30. Next Sunday, Lord willing, we will be back live and online again at 11 o'clock Sunday morning. For more videos, be sure to check out our church Facebook page, Lebanon First Church of God, or go to YouTube and type in our church name there in the search bar, and our video channel should pop up. And if you would like to download an audio copy of our Sunday morning message, you can go to our church website at lebanonfcog.org, and you can download the podcast, and uh, you can even download the PDF uh, copy of the notes, the sermon notes that go along with it. Very soon, we are hoping to announce a reopening date for us to come back together uh, we miss all of you, and we are so looking forward to being with you in person. So stay encouraged, stay safe. You are loved. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.